I was reading this week. I put a quote here because I, I read this uh, a couple days ago and I thought that basically summarizes everything that not only we've been learning for 23 chapters, but it summarizes Matthew 23. It says, um, his being Jesus, unrelenting concern for holiness is made clear in his uncompromising and se severe attacks on the scribes and the Pharisees. From the beginning, Jesus had to has told his followers that what they teach and who they are cannot be separated. He is the sworn enemy of hypocrisy. I love that. He's the sworn enemy of hypocrisy. I actually wrote that in my journal. So if you're wondering, what on earth does that mean? This is what it means. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, I want to make a note of this. The audience has now changed. So the last few weeks, who has Jesus been speaking to? He's been speaking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the scribes. He's been speaking to kind of the, uh, the experts and also the, the, the leaders of the Jewish people. Now, this is a really interesting question, and we're going to have to ask it um, throughout the night. Why is it that what Jesus is about to say is said now to the crowds and his disciples? So we're going to have to piece through that uh, in the next 90 minutes or so. So he's speaking to the crowds and the disciples, and he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. We'll talk about that in a second. So do and observe whatever they tell you, comma, but not the works they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have but one teacher, and you are all brothers and sisters. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither uh, be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted." It's a pretty heavy-handed teaching. I think this is like the intro to, um, I don't want to call it trash talk, but what Jesus is about to say is like very condemning. So we're about to get to what's considered uh, called the seven woes. So you should write this down. Um, and this is kind of the introduction to the seven woes. So let's kind of piece it, uh, pull it apart and, and see what's going on here. Before we just uh, jump in, what stands out to you? I'm just curious. First blush, we read it. What, what jumps off the page to you? Yeah, okay. It's very much like what's going on today with the way our uh, country is being run. Actually, it sounds almost like the administration that's running our country right now. Aren't those awesome when that happens? Because then you're like, wow, God's word is very easy to apply in this situation, right? Um, sometimes it's not like that. Sometimes, you know, the senior pastor of your church tells you to preach about the priestly garments and you're trying to figure out how that applies. Um, I'm not bitter at all. I enjoyed it. But <laughs> it's sometimes you read it and you just think, wow, this with a little bit of a tone or word change could just be written right now to us. Yeah. I, th I think we'll piece out some specifics. So I might come back to you in a second. What else stands out to you? What would you say in one sentence, if you had to just summarize it in a sentence or a phrase, that Jesus' main quip with these Pharisees and Sadducees is? Yeah, they're hypocrites. I love that word. Um, many of you already know this. This word in Greek is the same word for a stage actor who's really good at playing the part and sticking to the script. This is the person in ancient uh, theater who wears a mask and plays a part, um, and then just takes the mask off, walks off the stage, and is an entirely different person, which is a really interesting word. So Jesus is saying, you're a hypocrite. Even so far to say, what they say with their words is worth following. Did you catch that? Yeah. He says, what they say with their words is worth following, so listen to them and do what they say, but don't do what they 
Okay, so we have phrases for this. What are the phrases? Practice what you preach, right? Yeah, if you're going to uh, talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk, right? We have phrases that have lasted a long time. So let's, let's uh, just kind of go verse by verse here. So let's talk about uh, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. What is Moses' seat? We've been in Exodus for a while. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Moses' seat is he has the authority to declare what the law says. And traditionally in Judaism, Moses' seat is reserved for those who get to interpret it correctly. We're going to talk about that in, in a, a little while because there is interpretation necessary. Um, because sometimes, for instance, the Ten Commandments is, is very clear in one sense, but then there becomes kind of like real life examples of like, well, what constitutes murder, for instance. Like even in our own legal code, we have different degrees of that crime. So how do we punish and how do all these things work? So we're going to talk about that. So what, they're, what he's saying is these people collectively have the authority given to them to sit on the same seat of Moses. Their responsibility is to take God's law and distribute it to you and give you the interpretation for how to do it. And he says to them, do and observe whatever they tell you, but don't follow what they do. It's very interesting. I think by the first century, Jesus is not saying anything that is, um, is groundbreaking to these people. I think the groundbreaking piece is that Jesus is saying that you're allowed to question them. Most people by this point have looked in and realized this is a corrupt uh, system. The people in charge are not practicing what they preach, but we're Jews, and Jews got to follow the rules, so we just have to go along to get along. And now Jesus shows up, and he says things about Pharisees that make them very mad, and he's beginning to grow kind of an audience that is kind of revolutionary, and they're thinking that you can push back, and you can question what they actually do with their actions. So he says, for they preach, but they do not practice. I love verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's sh shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They're not even willing to exert enough energy to like, help like, unpack the load even a tiny bit. I was thinking about this verse, and I was thinking about um, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Pastor Scott. You guys all know Pastor Scott. Uh, about right around Christmas time, this piano here was not on those caster wheels. It was just on the ground. Anybody ever tried to lift a piano before? So um, after church, we're going to get it off the blocks and put it on there. And I remember there was like five of us, and the original five people are like straining just to get it up. It's very heavy. It's a very heavy thing. And I remember he kind of saw, and he ran in. And I, I, you know, the moment that somebody lifts with you, and you feel like you're still lifting something, but they just took a ton of the burden off of you. I thought of that, and I thought, carrying that piano, this is what the Pharisees aren't even willing to use their finger to help you with a couple ounces of the pressure on you. That's what they're not. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, you know what? Jesus had something that he said that became kind of a, a rallying cry for the poor and the needy. That sounds an awful lot like this. Can you remember what that is? What is it? Yeah. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You remember that? Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus is saying, that is the action that you are called into. While the people who are in charge sitting in Moses' seat, they might say all the right words, but their actions, uh, they are, they're not integrated with what they say. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. And then he kind of goes into this laundry list of all the things that they love to do. I think we could just paraphrase it with they love outward appearances. They love appearances. In just a second, Jesus is going to say something that is a first century version of basically a curse word. He's going to call them something filthy and dirty. He's going to call them a whitewashed tomb. He's going to say, you're so obsessed with the outside, you want your tomb to look beautiful all the while, you're just death inside. We'll get there in a second. So here's what he says. Uh, they make their phylacter, phylacter, 
phylacteries broad and their fringes long. You guys familiar with a phylactery? I think traditionally Orthodox Jews use two. It's, um, they wrap them on their arms. Um, it's usually a leather wrap, and somewhere in there are scriptures on parchment paper rolled up really fine, and they also do it on their foreheads. Um, and it's uh, a command of the Old Testament. You might see um, what would be a common example is if you went on YouTube to see um, like the, the wailing wall at the, uh, the Temple Mount. Jews are often praying, and as they're praying, they're wrapping it around their arm. So it's holding God's word close to their head and close to their arm. So they, uh, they love showing those off. They have these ornate things that are really supposed to, at their core, just remind them of God's word being close to their heart and close to their life. And it's, they've, instead, they've turned that into like a fashion statement. Like, look at me. I have a big, beautiful phylactery. You know, style choices in 2022 are getting pretty weird. It, would, it wouldn't blow me away if phylacteries made a comeback like in modern culture. <laughs> it would be odd. Um, and they like their fringes long. Do you guys remember fringes from the book of Exodus? The tassels at the end of their yeah, the tassels at the end of their robes. They like theirs to be flowing and beautiful. Do you remember, um, this is like a, a test, do you remember from Exodus what the, the tassels are? Bells, there should be bells and what, pomegranates, right? The idea of God's joy and forgiveness, his fruitfulness and provision. And they've taken that and they've turned it into a fashion statement. Look at how beautiful my robes are. They love, place, uh, they love the place of honor at feasts, right? They love the adulation. They love the status. They love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings uh, in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by others. Basically, everything in their whole life is geared towards getting uh, affirmation and praise from the outside, and they're basically just polishing up the outside while not even bothering to take a look at their interior spiritual life. What's that? Uh, like they're seeking personal glory rather than the glory of God. Yeah, exactly. A personal glory over the glory of God. So this is uh, 100%. I think our whiteboard is getting a little loose. It might fall down. Oh, yeah, look at that. Not good. So for 22 chapters, we've been pointing this out, especially in um, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is primarily interested in his followers' inner life. He's been saying this over and over and over. If you tend to your inner life, if you submit to God in prayer and fasting and gathering and, and the reading of God's word, what comes out of you, he keeps using the same illustration, is what? It's fruit, right? So he's saying when you begin to focus on that, the outward becomes obvious. What his, his issue with the Pharisees is they have tried to bypass the hard work of submitting themselves to God. Instead of submitting themselves to God, they have in, in kind of a weird way become their own God, and they've made the outward appearance look as though they're spiritually mature when they are, we're going to hear what he has to say about them in a second, full of dead man's bones. I think if you like... Um, kind of technical theological terms. Um, if you were reading a theology book, this would be orthodoxy versus orthopraxy. Um, and I think this is actually an important dialogue to have because we're in a, an interesting place in time. I think usually... When we talk about these things, orthodoxy means what? It means right belief, and praxy means right action or practice. Now, I think this right here is usually how this is posed. So, for instance, we have this scripture in the New Testament that says, faith without works is dead, right? And if you are around like a circle of people who like to debate theology, what will they debate about when it comes to this? Are you saved by works? Or are you saved by grace, right? This is Martin Luther's like biggest, biggest issue with the Catholic Church, right? So which one is it? 
Because James seems to think that faith without works is not faith at all. So then there becomes this spiral debate. And I think the whole debate gets upturned when we, start, we stop pitting these two against one another. Because they're not. Jesus has no interest in saying, uh, I want you just to come to right belief and know all your theology. He's not saying that's not important. He thinks that's very important. He thinks it's so important that you know you've done it correctly when your actions start to produce fruit. Um, I, I think I, I've been blown away at times, and maybe you've had this experience. Have you ever met somebody that in, uh, I mean this in like the, the kindest way possible. I, I'm not trying to be rude or mean. You begin to talk to them and you realize, huh, in their kind of verbal articulation of faith, they're very young. They don't really have the words to describe things. They can't really articulate it well. Have you ever met people like that? But then you watch and you realize, their actions are that of a seasoned follower of Jesus. Have you ever seen this happen? This is why I want to bring this up. Because I think in America and in Western culture like ours in general, we are overly obsessed with right belief. Uh, we had a whole generation that said, all we need to do is get people to believe the right thing and say the sinner's prayer, and then we can move on, right? Right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Now, is saying the sinner's prayer wrong? No, absolutely not. It is a profession of everything Christians hold to be true. It is of utmost importance. But moving on without teaching discipleship, which is the right action of how a Christian lives their life, is an incomplete view. So there's been whole movements of people who have just kind of taken over the world for say the sinner's prayer, now your soul is saved and I can move on to the next one without ever pausing. Like, like Paul says, I lived among you, right? Because I wanted to instruct you on the right belief, but I also wanted to work among you and eat with you because I wanted you to see what being a Christian looks like. Does that make sense? So I think this is all to say this. I think Pharisees are obsessed with right belief. They are so obsessed with the minutia and the details. They're so obsessed with interpreting the theology that they don't even give a rip about the right action. Because when you look around and you realize, well, you're not worried about the right actions, and you're not worried about the right actions, and you're not worried about the right actions, and we're all in charge, now we don't have to be held to account to anything but our own beliefs. Does that make sense? Now there's no account to be held to. And so I think that's kind of where this is all going. And Jesus says this, the greatest among you shall be your servant. servant. Is servant primarily rooted in your belief or your actions? actions? Actions. Can a servant be somebody who hasn't quite figured out all the beliefs yet? Absolutely. We, we're all works in progress, right? The Pharisees would look at the people following Jesus and think, leper? What does a leper know about the Torah? Right? They haven't been allowed in the synagogue for their entire life. Right? And Jesus would say they are a disciple of mine and they are a work in progress towards understanding, but their life is already being transformed and there's already fruit. What does the Bible say? You will know them by their, their correct thinking and their theology, right? No. You will know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their love. That's how you'll know who the true followers of Jesus are. And this is what he's getting to the court. So uh, he says, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, I think the ESV did a really poor job because I, I just had this hunch and I wanted to look this up. It says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Now, if you look this word up, there is, uh, it's not even really a debate. Many scholars say this is the wrong word. This is a possible translation of the Greek word, but a better is this. The idea is to bring low, but outside of the Bible, this term is used to describe this. That to humble somebody is kind of like a cultural idiom for humiliate them. It is the idea of a, a Roman military officer conquering an area and forcing somebody on their knees against their will to pay homage to Caesar. It's a humiliation. And so I think this is what Jesus is saying. 
For anyone who is insistent of exalting themselves, about raising themselves into a high position, you will be humiliated. I just get this vision. I don't know if this is biblical or shaped by biblical understanding. Maybe it's not, so you can call me if it's not. I get this idea of God coming into the presence of God at judgment, God standing and everybody recognizing who he is, kneeling before him, but these people standing as though they're his equal. That would be a humiliating thing to do when he reveals himself as the lion, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's, what I, that's kind of the vision that I have for that. For the sake of time, let's, um, let's continue on here. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, now we're going to get into the, um, the meat and potatoes. Now, I've been anticipating this for quite some time. And I've actually been trying to um, say something almost every week for months now that I think is important. It's that every time we come to the Pharisees and we come to Jesus correcting them or judging them or calling them out, we have a tendency to pretend like that's not us. Like those are the bad guys. We're on Jesus' team. Get them, Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? And every time this comes up, I try my best to tell you how I've felt like there's a piece of what Jesus is correcting in the Pharisees and me that I think we're being invited to see ourselves in that light so that we can be corrected. And I say that because what's about to happen is I think the culmination of everything that Jesus has been saying against the Pharisees all kind of packed into one power combo, like a couple jabs and a hook. And so we call them the seven woes because there's seven of them and they begin with the word woe. Not W-O-W, but W O. E. Um, this idea of a woe is actually like an, an, an utterance of the best that I can gather, and I could be wrong. It's like a combination of grief and anger packed into one. It's the same exact concept in the Old Testament when the, the prophets are sent to the Jews, and they recognize these are my people. I, I don't want them to go into captivity, so I'm grieved by it, but I'm also angry at them. Does that make sense? And so this, uh, the seven woes, the number seven in the Bible represents what? Perfection, completeness. So I think there's seven woes for a reason. I think this is the complete case that Jesus has against the Pharisees. Um, the idea of a woe is definitely Jesus kind of stepping in to, uh, I would say, his prophetic calling. He's calling the people of Israel back to to faithfulness in the one true God. Um, and it's going to be very harsh and judgmental. Uh, before we get in, I just want to say one last thing. Um, s- most of you are older than I am. And I think that that actually does you a favor here. Because I think I, I was, um, I think I was telling Jimmy or maybe somebody else, I, I feel like I have one foot in like two different camps. And I feel like when I'm around older people, much more able just to say it how it is, even if it sounds a little bit harsh. Would you say that's true? I think younger people have been raised in a world where there's been very little hardship, and so everything has become like very oversensitive. Does that make sense? What we're about to read has no interest in like caring for people's feelings and how this sounds and be nice and be kind. This is 100% Jesus acting like a prophet, bringing God's judgment and wrath. And the Bible teaches that judgment and wrath are part of God's love. Part of his love is that he corrects and he directs. And when you walk outside of that, he does everything that he can do within human free will to bring you back on that course, even if it sounds like it's going to hurt some people's feelings. So you decide if this is going to hurt anybody's feelings. Verse 13. This is woe number one. I want to tell you we're going to move pretty quick, but if you flip your outlines over a couple pages, I, um, I also gave you like the cheat sheet. So if you're like, man, I'm not keeping track, just know that there's an overview of all seven woes and I think that's a pretty good snapshot of it all. But here's number one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. 
Yikes. So if you had to paraphrase what Jesus is denouncing or what is he condemning in their behavior, what is he condemning? Where do they sit? You sit on the seat of Moses. You have the keys to understanding everything that God desires for his people. You not only keep other people out, you don't even enter it yourselves. I think what he's saying is you have no you have no direction from God. You're not working on God's behalf. You're pretending to work on God's behalf for your own status. You have diverged so far from it that you don't even enter into what God wants for yourself, let alone helping the people who actually want to get there. So there's an element I, I picture just somebody trying to enter a door right as it's getting slammed in your face and somebody telling you, you can't see what's in there. But what's on the other side is the kingdom of heaven. So they don't enter it themselves. Um, I, think, I think we're going to see a little bit more. I, I think the seven woes, they go together. And as we continue, you're going to see them kind of build. But I, I think the argument is that Jesus is going to say, you are so focused on minutia and details. You're so focused on uh, defining all the terms to make you stay in the seat of power. Okay, you said it. Anybody uh, recognize people in places of power manipulating the system so that they stay in power? Yeah, like in other countries and stuff. You guys ever see that happen? <laughs> That's what these guys are doing. Um, I remember a, 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 something that a professor used to say to us when um, I was in, in college. He used to say, um, before he prayed to start the class, because I, I went to a Christian university, he used to say, uh, remember, you will never lead anyone to a place you've never been. Um, he was talking spiritually, and I think that's what Jesus is saying to them. You can't lead people into the kingdom because you've never been. Pretty sharp words. I think this is actually like, like pretty soft compared to where we're going. Verse 15. Woe to you. So number two, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He's really nailing home this hypocrite thing, huh? For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. What's a proselyte? A convert, right? In Jewish culture, a convert it would probably be somebody um, who you would train up in your way of understanding the Torah. Um, you probably know Jews are, have never been overly interested in like what we would call like evangelism. So a proselyte would be probably somebody that you're winning over to your way of understanding the Torah uh, as a disciple to a rabbi. Um, so he says, uh, let's see, you uh, travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Ouch. Uh, don't even really know exactly what to say, but I, I was thinking a bit about the culture that this creates. So... Um, let's see. I don't know a, a ton uh, about economics, but I know enough of the basics that usually when you read something that an economist writes, they're always looking for this golden rule, incentive. They're always looking for, if you want to min manipulate like market behavior, you want to figure out what are the incentive structures to get people to act a certain way. So what is the incentive for a proselyte joining a group of Pharisees. What is the incentive of that? Think of, for instance, the disciples of Jesus. What is the incentive for them to become a disciple of Jesus? What's that? Notoriety. Yeah. Even the disciples of Jesus, we've talked about this. They're, they're kind of like thrown off, like, you're not, you're not making it past middle school, dude. You might as well just go fish, right? And all of a sudden, Jesus comes, and culturally speaking, he invites them to come to Harvard, right? And so there's a le level of status and notoriety. Okay, so picture this. A high-ranking Pharisee comes into some small town far away. He traveled across land and sea because he heard there's a, a very uh, capable, potential disciple. And he chooses you. Now, do you want to get C's because C's get degrees? Or do you want to get straight A's with this guy? 
You want to get straight A's with this guy. And you know he's strict and he's fundamental to the Torah. So what are you going to do? You could do the same thing, but you could be even more strict, right? You, you could be even more demanding. You could heap even more responsibility on people. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. You've created this cycle where it incentivizes people to be even more strict and more harsh than even you are. And I think in some regards, the Pharisees would say, well, what's wrong with that? It's just more demanding. It's more adherence to the law. But Jesus doesn't see it that way. He sees it this way. He sees it as you make them twice the child of hell as yourselves. I put a little footnote there. This is our, um, our hell, Gehenna, which is um, debatable in one way about what Gehenna is. A lot of scholars say that's actually uh, the terminology for two places. Number one, where child sacrifice took place before Jerusalem was built. And it also probably served as a uh, kind of night and day garbage dump that was basically a tended fire where you could take all your refuse and throw it in the fire. So the idea is you're a child of the garbage dump. You're a child of the place that sacrifices children. Does that sound like a place where you sit in the seat of Moses and direct people into the kingdom? Quite the opposite. Okay. Woe to you, verse 16. Blind guides. Can you think of another time Jesus teaches about, about blind people who try to lead? Can you remember? You know, we have a phrase that comes straight from the Bible, the blind leading the blind. And what happens? Mm. Yeah, you just go full speed right into a ditch, right? So he's just calling them blind guides. You're the people who are supposed to lead, and you're leading all right, but you're blind while you do it. You're, yeah? I, I need to uh, just observe that if we have different translations than the ESV, chapter uh, verse 14 is gone. Oh, yeah. And so we have eight woes versus seven, so just uh, that can be confusing if you don't have the ESV. What do you have? And it has that in there, or it has like it has it in there with a note that says some versions don't have this one. I have to know it because of just my own studies. You know, I, I, I studied it in parentheses, which is well, I think I, is interesting. Has it in parentheses. Has it in parentheses. Um, so if if what they're saying, if you're not following, is um, that there is a um, even if you look on your outline, you'll see that we jump from verse 13 straight to 15. That is because verse 14 exists in some translations, and some translations have left it out, and some translations have put it in with a note that says the earliest found manuscripts of the New Testament don't have verse 14. Um, I, I totally spaced. I, I read very briefly about it. I don't, I don't know a ton. Um, so this is not my opinion. This is just I read that and thought, oh, that makes sense and moved on. And that would be that it makes significant sense that Jesus' condemnation of the Pharisees is the number seven. Um, but I don't actually know the, the backstory. So um, if somebody wants to look it up, write a research paper and present next Wednesday, that would be awesome. We're not meeting. I know. That was the joke. <laughs> Okay, so woe to you blind guides. If you say this ridiculous stuff, you say if anyone swears by the te temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. Okay, so let's just unpack this really quick. So if you swear an oath, something that should be true to the oath, and you swear by the temple, it is nothing, meaning it's loose, it's not binding, it's not a big deal, it's not illegal. But you say, if anyone swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound by his oath. Can anyone think of anything in the Old Testament that directs this sort of behavior? Yeah, me neither. So what is this? It's, I think in one, in one regard, totally made up. It's, uh, I think it's an interpretation of the law about oaths. But it's not just any interpretation. I think it's a, a self-serving one, one that basically gives me the leg up because I know the rules and I make the rules and you don't, right? It's pretty nice to play a game where you get to make up the rules and the people who you're playing against don't know the rules. 
right? So I think this is just an example of a self serving interpretation. Now, before we um, like jump on the bandwagon and think this is ridiculous, um, actually, you know what? We'll wait. Let me. Well, we can jump into it. How's this? So I, th I don't think we talked about this in Matthew. But before we started Matthew and we did our five-week study in the Bible class, we, we talked about something that, that Jews have that we don't. And it's called the oral Torah. <laughs> that was awesome. I wish that happened like at a better time. And then God said, let there be light or something. But just complete the, complete the task. Uh, the oral Torah turns into basically the how do you understand some of the more nuanced things that God says. You may notice that if you read the Old Testament, sometimes God is super specific, and sometimes it becomes a little bit vague. And when there's any vagaries, guess what Pharisees like to do? They like to jump in and start observing the interpretation and what is orthodox, what is the right belief and it's called the Oral Torah. And over time, these things get written down into a, a document that still exists, and you can still look it up, called the Talmud. The Talmud is basically one giant, it used to be living, but I, I don't know if anybody, I don't, I don't think it's contributed to anymore. But the Talmud for generations was famous, well-established rabbis that were respected would write commentary on what all these things mean and the history of it. It was basically like one giant volume of all Bible commentaries for the Torah. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example of what this might mean in, in kind of everyday real life. Um, this is like a classic example that people use often. So let's see. Uh, you shall not lie. How many of you would agree that lying would not be a good choice for a follower of Jesus who wants to be formed to be like Jesus? Would you agree with that? Now, is there any vagary or gray area on lying? Is there? Okay. Like, what are, like, I'm not, you could go on the internet and the same people are going to use the exact same uh, language, right? So the classic example is like, like, honey, do I look good in these clothes, right? Like, so is this an opportunity that you should just always tell exactly the truth? Like, man, maybe there's a better outfit, but it'll do. So what do you say? Do you say, meh, not my first choice, but it'll do. Or what would you say? Looks great on you. Is that a lie? Kind of, right? We have... We have like language in our culture where we say, oh, it's like a white lie. And I think at its purest form, it's like, you know what? It's chalked up. It's not, nothing of any value. And the reason you're lying is to protect somebody's hurt feelings or something. It's, it's nothing. It has no major consequence. Is it a lie? So should you not do that? Should you say, no, that outfit looks terrible on you. I sh I'm surprised you even bought that. You should burn it. Right? <laughs> So you see that there's interpretation necessary, and, and there's theological concepts like, like God calls us into love and calls us into community. And so there become some issues where different things kind of intersect, and you're not really sure how do you deal with this, right? Let me give you another example that's going to maybe irritate some people, but Jesus is literally about to do it. You shall not, this comes from the Bible curse. How many of you would say that it would be probably good practice for a Christian not to use four-letter words in English? Would you say so? Many, many of scholar has pointed out that Jesus is about to say two things that basically equate to four-letter words in the first century. And he actually steals one straight from John the Baptist's mouth when he calls people a brood of vipers. So is Jesus contradicting something in the Bible? Or is there something more at play here? There's something a little bit more at play here. Um, 
I, I think that there's examples throughout the Bible where you think like, hmm, maybe that's not. So th this is all just to say this. 100% you shouldn't say the F word, and you shouldn't get in the habit of using four-letter words. This is not like, oh, Andy said you can do it, so let's go. That's, that's not it at all. But I think there's a difference, and, and there's a difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And I think the letter of the law is much more what the Pharisees are interested in, the nuance and the minutia and the gotchas. Remember, they keep trying to get Jesus in these word games. And I think Jesus is interested in the letter of the law, but I think over superseding that is the spirit of the law. All of this is to say is this. The Pharisees have taken things like you shall not lie and you shall not curse, and they have interjected generations of interpretation that's stacked upon itself, and the, the fundamental way they've been doing it is based on the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. And so for decades and generations it builds, and what you get is that you can now swear by the temple, and it's not a big deal, but you can't swear by the gold in the temple. And then you look back and think with no context, how, how does that make any sense? How did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to the value judgment where that would make sense at all? And then he says, look it, uh, you blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that, was ma that made the gold sacred? So what is Jesus doing? He's saying, this is how you see the law. Let's zoom out and remind you of what the temple is. The temple is the reason anything in it is even sacred because this is where God's presence dwells. And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, eh, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by the oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swear, uh, whoever swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it, and whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. What does that mean? You swear by the temple and everyone who dwells in it. Who dwells in the temple? God. If you're Jewish, should this be ringing an alarm bell in your head? Because what did Jesus just say? You are guilty of what? Swearing by. Is there a, I thought I just heard a bird fly into a wall. Oh, oh, that's awesome. Oh, thanks for that. You've got good ears. Thanks. I appreciate it. So I think that was, this is what Jesus is saying. You've come up with all these rules. Let me just walk you step by step in three lines and show you that basically what you've done is made it appropriate to swear by the holy, unspeakable name of Yahweh, which is absolute, 100% no-no for Jews. That's what he just did. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Now, I put it in the footnote because Jesus doesn't like oaths, does he? He, I think Jesus would say there's no need for them. Well, maybe not that there's no need for them entirely, but there's no need for them between disciples of Jesus. Do you remember what he says? He says, let your, what is it? Yeah. Let your internal spiritual life be so formed to be like Jesus that your language is so true that just saying yes, everybody in your community means, that means yes. I don't have to do the put your hand on the Bible or do all the swearing oaths of the first century to make it mean anything because you are people who are so shaped by being truth tellers that yes literally just means yes. That's as good as a contract with a thumbprint and sign in blood. Just yes means yes and no means no. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. This is verse 23. Hypocrites. <laughs> this, this is just like, I think Jesus is like kind of pointing out how ridiculous this is. I, I think the first century would be seen how ridiculous this is, but give us 2,000 years to look back and this just makes them look even worse than ever, I think. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin. How many of you are in team cumin and how many of you are on team cumin? I'm just curious. A house divided. How many of you are on team cumin? Cumin? 
How many of you are like, I'm not getting in, involved in this debate at all? <laughs> What's that? Comino. Comino? OK. So you're just sticking with that. You know for certain that's how you say it in Spanish. OK, so you tithe mint and dill and comino and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Oh, interesting. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. That is a first century joke, ladies and gentlemen. That is funny. Basically, you are pursuing, why would you strain something? The, the imagery is of oil, and you strain it to make it pure. And so you are all in there getting the nitpicky things. All the while, the image is there's something giant and massive, the largest land mammal, and you can't even see it because you've got the microscope on getting the gnats out. And you swallow a camel whole. So here's the, the fourth woe. It's kind of this insistence on ins assigning tremendous value to little minute things while forgetting the things that actually have value. Um, I quoted this scripture from Micah. Many of you know it, and many of you have memorized it. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love kindness. Some of them say love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These are the weightier matters. Jesus is saying, if you don't have that right, I think what he would say is, I don't give a rip about your dill and your mint. Right? If you can't do justice and love mercy... If you can't walk humbly, then spare me your tithe of mint and comino. And then he finishes it off with a joke to make sure people realize how ridiculous. Thank you for the new word, by the way. <laughs> okay, the fifth woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You see what Jesus just did? He just switched from just using pure imagery, and now he's kind of coming for the heart of the matter. Because he, he didn't say, you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside are, are all the leftovers that you didn't eat. Now he's talking about real things. So you clean the outside, but on the inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. This is kind of the, the turning point where Jesus is saying, if you haven't caught on yet, this is about inside of you. This is your heart. You blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. I just get this idea of like being served a delicious, beautiful meal in something that looks really clean on the outside, and you're like, oh. and then you lean over to take a bite, and you realize it's like putrid and disgusting on the inside. I think that's what Jesus is saying. I think uh, this is kind of at the core of what Jesus has been kind of condemning them for and judging them for. It's that they have put an uh, inordinate amount of their time and energy and resources to making sure that from the outside looking, that they look perfect and clean and spotless. All the while, nothing has been done to their heart life. And so I think uh, the greed and self-indulgence is something that comes from being self-centered and self-serving. That everything that you do is to make yourself look good and to benefit yourself. Woe number six, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs. Let's pause for a second and get back on the same page. What do Jews think of dead bodies? Yeah. Now, that is a law. If your shadow touches a dead corpse, you have been rendered unclean, right? To be uh, in the presence of a dead body or death is rendering you unclean. Now, we've talked about this. Being rendered unclean is not permanent. It can be changed. You go through the ritual washing, and then a rabbi or a priest declares that you are now clean. But the idea of a corpse is always something that in a Jew's mind is like kind of the worst thing. It's terrible. It's disgusting. It's why they cast out lepers. Not only are lepers unclean and you don't want to be around them, but they are like seen as walking death. And so 
You can't have that around. So what he says to them, you are like whitewashed tombs. Outwardly you appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. I think Jesus uses his words very carefully. I think the word that he just used, lawless, is intentionally used at the Pharisees. These are the people who should know the law. Um, Victoria, you were going to say something. Um, Wow, I, I didn't know that. Did everyone hear what she said? She said in Jerusalem there are street signs that warn priests not to continue this way because you're going to pass by a graveyard and it does, you don't want to render a priest unclean. So that's how much these people don't want to be around death. And Jesus just said, you could do all you want to stay away from death. You're dead on the inside. You are, you're walking death. I think the image is you are the people who are, who are called to help people live fullness of life, and you are living fullness of death. Yeah, Peggy. The other thing I found was that one of the purposes of whitewashing is that some graves are not noticeable, and so it's a courtesy to whitewash them as a notification, don't touch this. And I didn't know that. Either. Oh, I didn't know that. So it would be like what, like a, a rough stone or something where someone's no, buried? Actually, Oh, yeah. Over the dead bones, and of course, they can't touch that. So when they see the whitewash, they know there's, a, there's bones there, and they're not supposed to touch it. That, that's such a great image from Ezekiel. They do everything they can to make it look beautiful, and they don't deal with the structural damage, yeah. and it just falls down. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Same exact theme. I think it's just nailed home even more. Jesus is saying you've spent all your status and all your prestige, everything about you, to appear like you're living the fullness of life when in fact you're just walking around. You might as well just be a corpse. For a, a Jew that is being told that you are perpetually unclean, that is like how Jews viewed the hemorrhaging woman or the leper. You are permanently on the outside looking in is what Jesus is kind of saying. Um, woe to you, this is number seven. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. This is at the heart of what we've been talking about. This is the tendency to always look backwards or always look at someone else's situation and just assume that I would never have gotten caught up in that. I would always be on the right side of history. I would have always followed God. I would have always done the right thing. I think this is like green lights flashing. You should walk in this and hear this for yourself. So he's saying to them that you are, uh, let's see, you build the tombs of the prophets and you decorate the monuments of the righteous. So you're highlighting these mighty men of God, all the while saying, we would have never taken part in killing them. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. The idea of filling up the measure of your fathers is you're going to take the punishment for the sin uh, of multiple generations. It's the idea that the same punishment is coming to you. You serpents, you brood of vipers. You remember another time this was said? And how did they like that? They liked it so much they killed him. I think Jesus, again, is using his words exactly how he wants to. I think he is bringing awareness to not only did these people's ancestors kill the prophets, but these people and their descendants will kill the prophets, including who? Him. 
And I think he's using the same words as John the Baptist to remind them, hey, these are the people who killed John. See what happens when I use the same words as he does. So you serpents, you brood of vipers. This is a first century, um, this is very, very nasty language to call somebody this. Um, by the way, why is that? Even for Jews, what does the serpent represent? The force in the world that made the whole thing go corrupt and wrong, right? So what is he saying? You are the offspring of the serpent. You are part of their brood. Yikes. You are part of the reason the world has gone astray, is kind of what he's saying. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you kill and crucify, and some who uh, you will flog in your synagogues. Did you guys notice anything there? What happened? What tense is this? Past tense. Some of them you killed. That already happened. Some of them you... What is he talking about? He's talking about himself. He's also talking about the fate of those who are going to follow after him. They will be dragged, and this literally happens, dragged for kind of corporate public punishment before a synagogue. You are a Jewish convert proclaiming that this Jesus fellow is the Messiah. We're going to give you a couple chances to change your mind. And what do they do? Flog, beat, stone, hold captive. What is Jesus saying? Their behavior is not going to change at me. Their, cha their behavior is going to continue, and they are going to persecute those who come after You'll flog some in the synagogues and persecute them from town to town so that, on, uh, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. I made another footnote there, but we made note of that. That comes from um, Second Chronicles. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So what will come upon them? They will persecute those who proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, and righteous blood will be held on their account. Pretty heavy words. Um, so I think this is what Jesus is pointing out. I think he's pointing out the same thing we've been pointing out, and that's these Pharisees, the reason that they can't see themselves for people who need to be corrected or have a change of course is because they constantly read history and read the world as though they're the good guys. They've decided that they are the good guys. So I was doing some thinking about why that is. Why do these guys think they're the good guys? I think there's lots of reasons. I think number one, they have positions. So I think they're already predisposed to not wanting to be corrected, right? If you are the boss of a company um, and there is some structure in place for like disciplining employees, is it pretty hard to accept any kind of uh, discipline on yourself? Like who holds you accountable? So when nobody holds you accountable long enough, you start to think, I wouldn't have killed a prophet. Not me. I wouldn't have done that, right? When uh, people understand the culture that you've created and they say, like, ooh, we want to make sure we get brownie points, so make sure that rabbi gets a seat of honor at the next feast, and you get the seat of honor every single time without asking, because that's how corrupt the system is, what do you slowly start to think about yourself? Deserve I deserve it. I'm really important, right? When people come to you and say, hey, um, I was uh, in this synagogue and I was curious what your interpretation of this passage of the Torah was, and people are always coming to you because you're an expert and you get to answer all the questions, what does that slowly make you think? I'm the smartest guy in every room, right? 
So people are telling you you're great. You're in a position where you have authority. And over time, this really begins to warp your mind into thinking, I'm always in the right. Jesus is in the wrong. If you don't think this is possible by human psychology, consider, um, I was thinking about the pharaohs of Egypt. And what happens when a child pharaoh is born? Pharaoh is not a king. Pharaoh is God on earth. And a child is born this way, and they are told from a very, from the second they're born, that you are what? God. Okay? So you grow up as God. That's literally your identity. I am God. I can point, give thumbs down, and somebody will chop someone's head off. Will I be held account? Nope. I'm God, right? What do those pharaohs literally think? They're God. And we can look back and think, did they really think that? Is that really possible? I think 100% that really is possible. Um, just look at celebrity culture, right? You are important. You are on a big, giant screen. Literally, you are projected larger than life, right? When people want to be entertained, we ask you to come on an interview. Uh, we'll release the ratings. Millions of people sit on their sofas and watch you because you're so awesome and you're so great, and the tabloids follow you. And even though you pretend you don't like it, the paparazzi wants to get your photo, and you're like, oh, no, no, no. Oh, like, I did do all my makeup before coming on the sidewalk, but now I'm going to pretend like I don't like it. Right? What do people start to think? I really am important. Um, this is like a total sidebar, and you can correct me later if you want to. I am blown away. Um, actually, I'm not blown away. That's not what I'm trying to say. I think this is the culture where people who literally have done nothing in their life start to make comment on like social or political issues. And you're like, does this person not realize that they are an actor? They were a child actor. And how this works, they probably didn't even graduate from high school. And all of a sudden, now they have influence over politics and social issues. Why do they do that? Because they've been told thousands of times for their whole life that your opinion matters. You're a big deal. Every room you walk in, people want to be just like you. You're an influencer, right? When you post something on Instagram, you get a million thumbs up. You're a big deal. And so I got to weigh in on everything, even stuff that's like way outside of my depth. That's what happens in this culture, and I think this is what happened to Pharisees. And I think the part that is the woe, remember we said a woe is kind of this combo of grief and anger. I think the grief part for Jesus is that no matter what you think of these people, these people are his people. They're his people. They grew up with the same stories around the campfire. They grew up singing the exact same songs. They grew up with the same rhythm of, uh, of Sabbath rest and going to the synagogue and learning the scriptures. These are his people. So the the grief element is they're so hardened they won't even accept the correction to bring them back in to the graces of God. And so this is how it ends. I think this is, this is the grief part. I think Jesus has got out the anger part. And here is the grief. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I, notice what he says, I? He is speaking as the second person of the divine eternal trinity. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? Do you notice he used the exact same word, the brood of serpents and the brood? He does not desire them to be a brood of vipers. He desires for them to come under the protection of the wing. And you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Um, what's interesting is this uh, idea of blessed is he who comes uh, in the name of the Lord. It comes the very next verse after what Jesus taught in Matthew 21, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's the it's the very next verse in uh, Psalm 118, or one of the very next verses. Uh, the idea of uh, the, the gathering under the feathers and under the wing, um, what is uh, under the, 
under God's wings. What does that il illustration mean? It's an image that gets used a few times. Protection. The shadow of, of the wing. Yeah. It's the protection of God. It, it's God saying, like, you are my people, I will protect you. And Jesus is saying, like, that's why the prophets were sent to you so that you could stay in the protection of God and you have refused. So I think this is the grief of Jesus coming out. I think there's other uh, variations where Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. The idea is that this grieves his heart. These are not his enemies, these are his people. And he wants to call them back into right relationship. Uh, I think one last thing that we um, should talk about or just remind of, we read all of these woes, and I think the chart is helpful. Um, we have a couple minutes, so if you wouldn't mind going back to the, the chart. I think that it's important, especially with such heavy words of kind of judgment and woe over these people, to think of ourselves in some way. So to think of ourselves as uh, you, so he's talking to the Pharisees, but we got to ask ourselves, is there times when I shut the kingdom of heaven in people's face? Are there times when I do it because I refuse to enter it myself? I think these are the questions that if the Pharisees asked, they would immediately be put back into, you can be welcomed in to the shadow of the wing, the protection of God. Do you travel great distances and do you know, crazy trips and things to make one single proselyte or convert and then make them twice as perverse as yourself, right? I think all of these things are important. Do we create weird value judgments where we're telling people that you're allowed to do X, Y, and Z, but totally fail on justice and mercy and love? Uh, do we come up with the minutia and the details of saying, yeah, make sure you tithe your comino and your dill and your mint and forget those things? Do we spend way too much time dealing with what we look like on the outside, maybe not just physically, but the words we use around church, around Christians, where we appear a certain way without submitting the inside to God. I got to tell you, guilty. Not all the time, but guilty. I think that's part of who we are as humans. I think part of what Jesus invites us into is to confess that as a sin. And once we do, it's not held to our account. It's washed in the blood of Jesus. But if we refuse to do that and acknowledge that, over time, we will become like the people Jesus is speaking to, whitewashed tombs. Um, are you the people who swear up and down that you would never have participated in anything vile or terrible, all the while you're venerating the tombs of the people your dad's killed? That's kind of what this is about. I think those are important questions to ask. And I, I got to say that each one of us is different. We're wired different. Our personalities are different. Our temptations are different. Some of them might just be a blunt, no, I don't struggle with that. But some of them might be, you know what? I'm going to open my heart to be convicted so that I can confess and, and return into the shadow of the wing. Um, I wanted to open my Bible really quickly and read this because I think it's important to keep the story going and to rem remember that this is one um, unified account. And what happens next is sort of just mind-boggling. So he laments over Jerusalem. His grief is coming out. He's been angry and he's proclaimed woes. Chapter 24 opens this way. So he left the temple. Just imagine the emotion pulsing through this guy. The, Jesus, the Lord and Savior, the eternal second person of the Trinity on earth, wanting to bring salvation to his people, and they're refusing. And then the disciples point out to him how beautiful the building is. It says, Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Like, Jesus, did you pause and recognize how beautiful this place is? Look at how great the walls are. Look at how cool the stones are, right? We just got done saying we shouldn't pretend like we get it. Do the disciples get it? No. I think here's the, the kind of question. Well, let me finish here. 
But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. What is Jesus saying? If you're insistent that the building is the most important thing, you're going to be very disappointed. Right? I think Christian faith for only by explanation of the, the power and the faithfulness of God has thrived at some of the worst times in human history, the times where the buildings get burned, the times where it's like, we'll hunt you with a gun or put you in prison for trying to gather. And sometimes Christians go underground and we think like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And it is. And we think those things and we think like, man, I wish other people had a place like this. And this place is beautiful, don't get me wrong. But when it becomes about the place and you forget the power of God to gather his people in a way that doesn't matter about the building, that it's about the movement of God's people out into the world, not the movement of God's people into a building to protect us. Um, this place is not a fortress, it's a refuge, right? This is not a place where everybody get in, pull up the drawbridge and release the crocodiles into the moat so no one can get in. This is the, the, the hospital where people gather so that they can be made whole and then sent back out. And I think Jesus has tried to tell them that, and they're going to be a little disappointed at first, so much so that they can't deal with it. They just go back to fishing. But Jesus is also uh, proclaiming something that literally happens in the year 70 AD. The Jewish historian says that the proclamation is made to go into Jerusalem to level it and especially go at the temple. And guess what they are commanded to do? Your mission is not complete until there is no stones left on top of one another. So what Jesus is saying before 70 AD is um, prophetic as well. Any uh, questions or thoughts as we wrap up tonight? Yes, yeah, Cecil. Oh, yeah, the Father. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think, I think it's a tricky verse for us because we think like, oh, am I not allowed to like address my dad as my dad? Because it's kind of what it seems a little bit. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you, but I think it's rooted in a, a culture where the father is the ultimate authority figure over a household. That's how the Roman and Jewish systems were set up, where the father of the household was in the system the highest authority over you. So when you address someone as father, you are addressing the person that had the ability to basically proclaim your entire life for you. So I think what he's saying is not don't acknowledge your earthly dad. I think he's saying don't acknowledge another human being as the authority over you because you only have one of those and he's in heaven. I think that's what he's saying. Um, that is an opinion and I, I could be wrong, but that's what I kind of took from that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everyone's father, 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 yeah. Yeah, interesting. Any other thoughts? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to have to do some heavy thought and prayer because uh, I, I might leave tonight with the one thing I might remember in a week is um, how to say cumin or cumin in Spanish. <laughs> so <laughs> we are all frail. Um, Let's pray, and then we can hang out. You can uh, exit if you have to, um, and we can go about our week. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it says it is sharper than a two-edged sword, that it cuts deep to us. And even in the idea of cutting, even though it hurts, you say that it separates the truth from the lies. And so we invite your word to convict our hearts. We ask that wherever we're at in our life, that we would submit ourselves to you, that we would continue moving forward in our submission to you, that you would reveal to us dark corners of our hearts, that we would allow you to shine light on them. Would you help us to be gracious to one another in a, a vulnerable time of doing those sorts of things? Would we be the people that um, just speak hope and life to the world? hope in life, that we have identity and purpose in you, and that we don't have to be uh, ashamed of the things that we've done because you have paid for it all. So we turn to you. 
we confess our sin to you. We say that you are, are faithful and, and worthy to save. Amen. Amen. Thank you.